All right. So can everybody hear me? Yes. Perfect. Yes, yes, you can. Okay, so uh, uh, I'm going to start off. Uh, I was, uh, I sort of left the last class somewhat incomplete. I originally intended to finish the recording and then I realized that maybe it wasn't necessary because we actually go over some of that in today's class. So, but before I begin today's class, I want to go back over the key points of what we covered in the last class. And I'm going to be interrogating you guys with some questions and uh, I hope you can answer, right? So what was the basic problem we discussed in the last class, anybody? Someone? Uh, scanning over an image with a multi-layer perceptron. So, the, and what was the problem itself? Why were we doing that? Uh, so the, pro the problem was because we wanted to be able to, uh, in the case of an image, we wanted to be able to identify an object irrespective of its position in the, exactly. uh, the image. So, you know, if you had an image, you wanted to know whether there was a flower here. Uh, you wanted to know whether, whether it had a flower regardless of where the flower was. And so what we did was we built a little MLP that could uh, sort of analyze a little patch and tell you if there was a flower or not. And then we scanned this. We sort of scanned this image, this entire image. And when you scanned it, you got one decision per location. And if it, it did indeed have a flower, at least one of these locations would have an output that was close to one. And we so put this whole thing through a soft max or a max and we got a decision. And we could do the same thing for sound as well and offer for one dimensional scans where uh, if you wanted to find, regardless of uh, whether the recording had the word welcome, if you wanted to find it, uh, regardless of the position, then uh, you built a little MLP that could analyze just a little section of the audio and then scan it. And you got one decision per location. You could take a soft max over the lot and it would tell you if it was, if this thing had the uh, word or not. And then what was the next thing we did when we, I spoke of scanning? What is the next thing we discussed? Anyone guys? Someone, okay, if nobody replies, I'm gonna pull a name, right? So I suggest, yeah. I think we uh, distributed the, the scanning. We had shared parameters and- Yeah, but before that, we said that we can change the order of the computation, didn't we? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So what was that we did the next? What what was that we did next? Going back to our case of the flower. What was that we did next when we wanted to uh, scan it with say this this MLP? Do you remember? We considered one large network with many such MLPs. But before that, we had some logic behind it, something else, but was, yes, you're right. This was, you're right. So this was basically scanning and putting everything through a softmax is the same as having one large MLP, one for every position, and then all of their outputs are going into one softmax, right? So basically we said that this act of scanning itself was one giant MLP, but what was special about this MLP? Every neuron scanned the whole image first. That was the procedure, but what was special about this large MLP itself? Oh, they all share weights. So this portion of the MLP shares weights. Yeah. Correct. And so uh, that was one. There was a second thing we said we, about reordering the computation. What was that? So if this was my MLP, what was that we said? You compute one mini um, network first, uh, propagate it back, and then kind of add the so weight. There, the, there was no propagation. I'm speaking of this going forward. So what we were speaking of, 
we did like the first layer of neurons of every MLP going forward first, instead of doing one full MLP. Exactly. Right. So I said, I could actually scan the input with this MLP, with this neuron. And if I scan it with that neuron, I'm going to get a map for this guy. I could scan it with each one of these four. And so what I've done was that instead of scanning the entire picture with the MLP, I scanned the entire picture with just the first layer neurons. And then subsequently, I could scan these maps with the second layer neurons. And then I could scan these maps again. Then you're scanning these guys, you're scanning them simultaneously with the third layer neurons. And this final map is going to tell you about the decision about a flower in every position in the initial image. And I could put this entire collection through a softmax. And we say, and uh, why do these things disappear? Oh my good God, I'm sorry. So what was it we said about uh, uh, the, the comparison of the two modes uh, of, of uh, processing, it, whether we did it with the entire network or whether we did it with, uh, do it in reordered format. So how would this compare? But it was the same thing. They're gonna give you the same thing, right? So that's what we, and now, I'm not sure what's happening. There's uh, you have to pardon me. The, I'm having trouble with one note and the laptop. Okay. So this process first, a little bit of uh, terminology. Uh, We'll actually get to the terminology in a few seconds. Then we sort of advanced this and said we can do things slightly different. You know, or we can uh, do things slightly better. So what was the last second stage in the proceedings when we discussed this whole topic? Someone mentioned it earlier about distributed representation. So what was yeah, that? I believe we were trying to emulate what the MLPs does, hierarchically building on the structures. Yes, yeah, so we wanted to, in, so in this original picture, the way I, we did it just now, the first layer neurons, the first layer neurons were actually scanning the flower sized patch, right? And, and forming their maps. And when the second layer neurons scanned these maps, the second layer neuron was actually looking at only one position in the maps of the first layer neurons at any time to take a decision at, about the corresponding location in the image. So the entire, the burden of extracting all the patterns in the image was transferred only onto the first layer neurons in the standard representation. Whereas what we, we said that in an, an MLP is most effective when the, dis, when the representation is distributed, when the lowest layer the neurons capture smaller patterns, and then the ones that go on higher actually capture uh, more complex patterns from the patterns captured by the lower layer neurons. And that structure is kind of being lost by this guy here, where every neuron is looking at the entire patch, right? And so we decided that we want to do things somewhat differently. I still have my picture to scan. I'm still going to scan it with this MLP. So again, I'm still scanning the entire picture with the MLP, but now these first layer neurons are going to be looking at tiny regions of the size of this kind when they scan the picture. And so these first layer neurons are going to create their own little maps, but then each point on this map actually looks at only a small region of the input. And then the second layer neurons, instead of looking at a single dot over here, they actually look at a region of the maps in the for, uh, created by the first layer neurons. And so when they do so, this guy looks at say this entire region here to take a decision for one point. And so these neurons would simultaneously be looking each of these neurons. So even just this one neuron is going to be looking at these little regions of the maps produced by the first layer neurons. And they, they would scan 
in this manner. And when they scan, they're going to create their own maps. So this guy would similarly scan and it would create its own map. And now if you looked at any position over here in this map, that is going to correspond to this location in the map of the first layer neuron, which is probably going to be a region of this size in the input image. So do we remember this? Questions here? Yes. Okay. And we said we could recurse this process, right? This guy can look at a region here. And so any point over here is going to be looking at this region here, which is this region here, which is this region here, right? And so we've distributed the representation over the entire uh, network. And now, of course, you can pass this whole thing over the softmax, through the softmax. Again, at the end of the day, you're still scanning this input. You're still scanning this input in terms of the of this large block. The only difference was that even within the large block, we had additional finer resolution distribution. Correct? And so in the process, now if I gave you this three layer, this three, two, one neuron over here, and let's say within this large block over here, like so, uh, I had something like 16. So the large block is the guy seen by this upper one, upper neuron over here. And let's say within the large block, this little guy looks at this little box and that occurs 16 times. So what was the actual effective network that analyzed this larger block? Was it three, two, one, or was it something larger? Anyone remember? Someone or anyone on chat? So again, if I'm trying to analyze this block, right? Using this neuron, but this due to the distributed nature of the representation, this guy is looking at only one small block of this size, right? And let's say this block can be fit here, say 16 times within this large block then what was the actual size of the MLP that was analyzing this larger one, at least with respect to the first layer? Anyone remember this? How many copies of this guy would you see in the actual MLP analyzing this block? Pardon me? Oh. No, it's gonna be four times four, 16, right? Because this one, by the time you get here, you're looking at 16 analysis by this fellow, right? It's going through this four times four. And so you'd actually end up with 16 copies of this first layer neuron, all somehow feeding to the final neuron just to analyze this block. And these 16 copies is going to be one copy looking at this location, the next copy looking at this location, the third copy looking at this location, the fourth copy looking at maybe this location, I'm, I'm losing track of colors. And then the fifth copy would be perhaps looking at this guy and so on. Do you remember that figure from the last class? Anyone? Yeah. Okay, who didn't get it? Anyone who didn't get it? So, Professor, uh, the entire uh, window would, would be looked at by the single neuron uh, at the same time, right? I mean, uh, so uh, if you look at if you look at this is the bigger picture. Let's say you're just looking at this window, right? If I have a three, two, one network, and let's say this guy looks at a two cross two region of the maps created by this guy, right? So this one is going to be looking at this region, right? Right. Okay. And if it's looking at that region, then it's going to be looking at four of these values, assuming that there are four of the small blocks within this region. So this guy is looking at four outputs by this fellow, correct? Mm -hmm. 
That is the equivalent of saying I have four of these neurons, each of them looking at a different block. And all four are feeding into the second level neuron. I also also have four of the second set, second neuron. And so this neuron is actually going to be getting 12 inputs, four from this fellow, four from here, four from here. And there are four copies of this fellow, of, the, of this neuron. Similarly, there are four copies of this neuron and there are four copies of this neuron. So although I drew a very simple structure out here, the actual shared parameter network that's analyzing this block is much larger. Did that make sense? Understood, yeah. Right? And so what, again, uh, I won't spend too much time on this. What, was the, what were the benefits of having this kind of distributed representation? There were three that we listed. We have less parameters. Why? And oh, because um, uh, I think there was like a um, because um, if we have to like, I think that there was like thirty two in the example, and like if we um kind of aggregate this, um, I think we could reduce the parameters on the upper levels. Actually, this is the so here is here is the exact the answer is right on the screen, right? How many unique parameter sets are we going to have in this network? How many sets of weights? Eight. Six, actually. One, two, three, four, five, six, right? Oh, yes. Right. But how many neurons do we actually have over here? Just for this one block, I actually have 12 neurons connecting to the second neuron, right? Correct. And then I'm going to have four copies of that guy connecting into the third neuron, if, it's, if I've got this in four blocks. So the actual network is going to have 48 neurons in the first layer and 48. So it's 48 times two, 96, I think. And then uh, four times two, eight neurons in the second layer and one neuron in the third layer. That is the size of the actual MLP that scanned, scanned this block. Does that make sense? Yes. Right? So you got a very large network out here, but the number of parameters was very small. Make sense? Who didn't get that? Raise your hands if you have questions. I, uh, I have a quick question. Yeah. So just to be clear, the, the top uh, most node in the first layer uh, of your example on the on the previous slide, but we have this three, two, one structure. And then in the first layer, in the first node, that uh, is looking at the, um, the sub square that is located in the top left-hand corner. And then the uh, middle node in the first layer is looking at like the top right-hand most, uh, top right-hand sub square. So top left hand. So here, here, let me go back. Let's consider this yeah, is just yeah. one block. This is not the entire picture. This yeah, is the one, okay. okay. So then this guy, assuming that it's it's scanning such that I can get 16 of these fellows, right? Okay. So then this guy is going to be computing 16 values on 15, 16 different regions of this block. Correct? Okay. Right. So that, that means I'm going to have 16 copies of it. Effectively, they're identical, but I have 16 copies of it. Okay. Right? Similarly, I have 16 copies of this guy. Yeah. Wait, why are they identical? Because this neuron is scanning this region, right? So the oh. parameters it uses to analyze this are identical to the parameters that it uses to analyze this block. Yeah. Uh huh. Right? So they're identical. In terms, yeah. of the, in terms of the output is not identical, the parameters are identical. I have no idea why this one node does this nasty thing. <laughs> okay, okay, right? that makes sense. Right? Yeah. So, right. So, so from this, I'm going to try to draw this. I'm getting, this is getting tiresome. Oh, shoot. Bear with me. And this 
series of lectures is almost certainly going to drag into four four lectures okay and partially because of one note thank you so this was my this was my network this one i had 16 copies of it 16 this guy once again i had 16 copies of it mm. and this guy i had 16 copies of it right and mm -hmm. now this this neuron if this fellow is going to be, well, I managed to draw something bizarre. This doesn't really have 16 blocks. I'll see if I can erase things too. Oh, oh. So this was my block, right? And 16 copies each. Now, if this one is looking at a two cross, so this would have maybe a, 16 cross 16 map, each of these. And if the second neuron is looking at a two cross two, actually this is going to have a four cross four map because it's only computing it 16 times, right? This neuron is going to create a four cross four map. Okay. And if this neuron looks at a two cross two region of this four cross four map, it's really looking at this region here, right? Yeah. So this neuron is going to be looking at four of these outputs. Simultaneously, it's looking at four of these outputs and looking at four of these outputs to get a single decision for this region, for this location. But then this neuron is going to be operating on this guy. If I'm skipping forward by two at a time, it depends on how, no, my stride. But right. if, I was, if I was skipping forward by two at a time, there are four copies of this neuron analyzing this block and four copies of this neuron, and the second neuron analyzing the same block. So okay. Four and four, right? And this one is looking at all four. So how many neurons did I have? Assuming a stride, these really very generous strides. I had 16 times three, 48, plus eight, plus one, which is 57 neurons analyzing this block. But the actual number of unique parameters was only six sets of parameters. Okay. <clears throat> okay. Right. So you get this yeah, tremendous, yeah. and if the stride is smaller, it's going to be like if it's skipping forward one one row at a time as opposed to two, mm -hmm. you're going to get you know the effective network is going to be even larger. But the actual number of unique parameters was very small, so we got this benefit that we got a tremendous reduction in the number of parameters. So of the benefits, if I had to list them. One was number of parameters. There was a second benefit. What is that? Um, there is shared computation. Pardon me? Um, you share a bunch of computation. I, you I, share uh, computation. You share computation because if you, were, if you were sliding forward by one element at a time, then going back here. Okay. I keep running out of space on this one. So if you were sliding forward by one, one element at a time in this case, for example, right? So if in the first block, I analyzed these 16 to get the output of this fella, right? The next block, when the whole network slides forward, it's going to be sliding forward to this region. And when it slides forward to this region, maybe I should draw this with a different color. Because the, the same neurons are being, uh, same neuron is, uh, same lower level neuron is analyzing these blocks, the computation of these nine blocks or these 12 blocks can be reused from the computation you had when you were looking at the first position. So you get a lot of reduction in the does that make sense to everyone? Questions? Questions, anyone? Yes, no. I'm assuming not. You guys are awfully quiet, right? So you get shared computation. What was the third benefit? Anyone remember this? 
more general generalizable. It's the, the distributed representation sort of gives you this this the uh, hierarchical composition of features. So that ends up being more generalizable because because of the hier hierarchical features. So these were the three big benefits of having this entire structure, okay? Now, and going back to all of this, this, this business of scanning an image with a neuron, a single neuron, that is called, or scanning a, 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 a one-dimensional, say, audio recording with a neuron. The general business of scanning any data with a neuron, that is called convolution. Scanning is convolution. That's why this is called a convolutional neural network. Questions? I assume not, right? And I, so what, I thought that um, the significance of the convolution was like the filter that you put onto it. Are you saying that that's like when we have a, a certain filter that we scan with, that's not the convolution, that any sort of scanning neural network would be called a convolution? So this is a scanning, this is a linear operation. There's a specific near, specific uh, 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 import to the term convolution. In that, what happens when you compute when you when you scan it with a neuron, a single neuron, not with the entire network? So this is the key piece, right? You're computing the inner product between the weights and the underlying image in that region, correct? That's just an inner product. That's that's an that, that's an affine function of the values underneath. And then you're scanning with this affine function. This business of scanning with a linear combination or an affine function of the uh, of the inputs. That is called convolution. So uh, this is straight from the signal processing literature. Remember, when I'm scanning this, scanning this guy with an with a neuron, I'm doing two things. Within each location, I'm computing w dot x location. Ignore the plus b, right? And so z location. We're do, we're performing this operation first. That's what the, and then we are doing the output for the location is whatever activation times Z location, right? Yeah. This business, this is convolution, the one on top. Mm -hmm. That's why we call it a convolutional network. Questions, anyone? Um, I have one question. Mm -hmm. Is this, is the name for convolution related to the mathematical operation? It is indeed. Okay. But it is exactly the same. I mean, there's a small, there's a little bit of abuse of terminology in that uh, if you're speaking of convolution from the signal processing sense, you'd have to, to flip your filter, but we don't really care. It doesn't make a difference in this, in this setting. So this guy, this weight, would be the equivalent of your signal processing filter, and this is your input. So this is basically like a flip and shift, but just without the flip? This is without the flip. I mean, you can think of it as pre-flip pre -flip forever and ever, right? But you could, in fact, do this with a fast Fourier transform. Make sense to everyone? Questions? Okay, so getting on with the topic of today's lecture. Oh my, I just used up half an hour just going over stuff. So I'm going to just sort of plunge on, but now's your time to ask me any questions. Uh, and uh, if I don't have any questions in the next 15 seconds, I'll move on. Questions? Okay, that was less than 15 seconds. So here's the story so far. Pattern classification tasks such as does this picture contain a cat or does this recording contain the word hello are best performed by scanning for the target pattern, 
Scanning an input with a network and combining the outcomes is equivalent to scanning with the individual neurons hierarchically. And uh, where the first level neurons scan the input, the higher level neurons scan the maps for, formed by the lower level neurons. And then you have a final decision unit, which, take, which could be a network of its own, making the final decision. So you have some additional issues, the top issues that I didn't uh, go over yet, but they were on the slides. For two dimensional or higher dimensional scans, the structure is called a convolutional neural network. If you were scanning only in one direction, that too is a convolutional neural network. It's a one dimensional scan, but we have a specific name for it. If you were working only for scanning in just along the X direction, that is called a time delay neural network. So in a time delay neural network, it's exactly the same operation as what we have here, except that you would now have this is going to be something like your spectrogram, right? And your filters are going to be this size. They're going to span all the way from the bottom to the top, which means the only direction in which they can scan is left to right. Other than that, the two are exactly the same operation. Operation. Any questions? Because TDNNs, I think, turned up in the quiz. So where did, so you'd imagine, Intuitively, this whole thing kind of makes sense. From a purely mathematical perspective, you would imagine that this is the first thing that somebody would have thought of, or at least one of the first few things somebody would have thought of when you wanted shift invariant pattern recognition. But that's not where the, the genesis of the model actually is from. The uh, genesis lies elsewhere. It starts with cats. Now, strangely enough, so, CNNs started off as a model for vision. People have been uh, curious about how vision, animal vision works for the longest time. How does the brain interpret and recognize the images that form in your eye? And most early research focused on behavioral patterns. How do we respond to visual stimuli? So typical studies uh, focused on visual illusions like phenomena like just out, for example, uh, how, what do you guys see in this image to the left? Anyone? A cube. Is there really a cube over there? No. Right? In fact, the lines aren't even there. You're just filling them in. There are only six Pac-Man-like dots, right? What about this guy here? A dog. Yeah, but there is no dog. There is no panda. And this? A spike ball. Yeah, but there are no spikes and there is no ball, right? You just made the whole thing up. And so uh, none of these figures actually has these patterns. And your brain fills in the details. So much of early uh, studies on, uh, on uh, vision focused on this kind of behavioral analysis. But behavioral studies don't really get to how the brain actually performs these interpretations. How do, how do you see this collection of triangular or conical looking things and, and actually see a spike and a ball when there is no ball, not a spike, right? So then the first real significant work on understanding the biology behind vision was this wonderful piece of work, wonderful unless you're from PETA, uh, by Hubel and Wiesel, where they studied the uh, neural correlates of vision. They studied the striate cortex of cats, and the striate cortex is the equivalent of the V1 region of the human brain, which is at the back of the head, right here, and connects directly to the eye. And now the, the human eye is an amazing artifact of really poor design. Stop and think about it. If you were constructing a robot and if you had a camera and the camera was connecting to things, which portion of, your, of the computational mechanism would the camera connect to? You'd connect it to the closest point, right? And then you'd sort of process things going backwards. No, in our eye, the eye connects straight to the back of the brain and then the signal comes forward as you think about it. It's really, really weird. Anyway, and then there are other issues about the eye that uh, the neurons that actually transmit the signals to the brain 
lie in front of the retina rather than behind it, which is a really bad design. So for the neurons to actually go to the eye, they have to punch a hole through your retina and then go back to the, eye, to the brain, which is why you have a blind spot. You have a blind spot because the neurons have to fold back and make a hole through, through your retina and go into your brain. Again, it has a, uh, if you were designing you know, uh, vision, vision system, that's not how you would design it. Anyway, getting back to our point, the striate cortex, which is at the back in, uh, uh, in the uh, cat's heads, is the equivalent of what we call the V1 uh, region of the human brain. So it's a strict analog, and it's called the striate cortex because the cells are striated in shape. They got these long lines, a uh, long striated structure. And Hubel and Wiesel decided to analyze the response of the striated, uh, striated cortex to see how they respond to visual stimuli. So they experimented with 24 cats. The cats were anesthetized with uh, truth serum and then electrodes were struck into their brains to take readings. Now they don't mention if the cats survived the experiment or not, but they do mention that after the experiment, the brain tissue was studied, so we can guess. Uh, but uh, here is the experiment they conducted. The cat was anesthetized. They sort of held the, held the cat's irises open mechanically and then beamed light of different wavelengths through the, through the eye onto the retina. And now they beamed light of different patterns, lines, dots, etc. And then they measured the cortical neuron responses. And here's how they, uh, they uh, uh, found the neurons to behave. Each neuron in the cortex was found to respond to a localized, so if this was the retina, it was found to respond to a localized region of the retina. So the region of the retina where that specific neuron responds to, to which the, that specific uh, uh, neuron responds is called the receptive field of that neuron. That's where it receives signals from. Now, within this region, they found something interesting too. So you would have structures like this, where uh, if, so this, if say this, say this was the uh, receptive region, uh, the, the receptive field, then you would have regions where, which would cause the neuron to respond. So if the, if the light fell in this region, the neuron would fire. These would be excite, excitatory regions. But then you had these other regions where if light fell here, it would actually inhibit the neuron from fire, firing. So does anybody, this is the inhibitory region. Now, does anybody remember where we've seen this kind of behavior in a computational model? I think it was the Pitts and Walter model or something. Mechelow, Mechelow and Pitts model, exactly. Yeah. Right. yeah. Very nice. Anyway, so that's basically what they found. And so what this meant was that for the neuron to respond, light had to fall on this region. At the same time, it did not, it could not fall on this region. So what would happen if you had diffused light with the neuron fire? Anyone? No. No, because the excitatory and the inhibitory regions cancel out. If you had light falling only in the inhibitory region, would it fire? No. No. So you basically needed light of this pattern falling in this region and not falling in the inhibitory regions. It was very specific. And now, so they were just sort of, they started off with dots and they moved the dots around. And they found that uh, the uh, neuron responded if the dots, if the, if the dot was moved in specific orientations, but not in other orientations. And so they, if you just map it out, here are the kinds of receptive fields they found for different neurons. This is the, uh, this blue region is the excitatory region. The reds are the inhibitory regions. You can actually see that uh, what happens is that they found that these receptive fields are linear patterns 
which could be horizontal, vertical, or at an angle like these guys. And this is just not for cats. Later experiments found this to be true for uh, other animals, including mice and monkeys. So here is one of their results. This is from their paper. In each figure, the bar to the left shows the direction of the orientation of the light they shown on the eye. This is just a dot that's moving around. Okay? And the longer the bar, and, and this is the response, the longer bar with the little ticks. So the more ticks you have, the greater the response. And for this particular neuron, you can see when the light is perfectly horizontal, there is no response. As the light begins to rotate, when it's vertical, there is the maximal response. And then as it begins to rotate back out, the response disappears. So uh, this particular neuron is responsive only to vertical bars of light. And so oriented slits of light were the most effective stimuli they found for activating the striate corpus. They ran uh, a great many more experiments and reported back in 1962 that there are, now this is the important bit, right? This is why uh, this the second bullet explains convolutional neural networks as we have known them for the longest time. So the, uh, the, uh, they found that there are in fact two levels of processing in detecting these patterns. And these are performed by two different types of neurons. The first level was performed by what they call the S cell or the simple cell. The second level, this, SL responded directly to stimuli. The second level was performed by what, the, what they call the complex or C cells. Now, both S cells and C cells responded to the same pattern, but the C cell didn't directly respond to the stimuli. The job of the C cell, C cells responded to the S cells. And the job of the C cells was to sort of clean up the response by the, of the S cells, which were susceptible to noise. So uh, here is this uh, model they actually come and came up with. On the retina itself, each neuron has a circular, uh, almost kind of circular receptive field. So how do we end up with these responses to longitudinal and vertical patterns, specific patterns? What they found was that each of the S cells was connected to a specific arrangement of retinal cells like this kind. So although each retinal cell was or had a circular reception, this S cell was going to fire for light that fell along this collection of retinal cells. So the S cell composed patterns from the retinal images, but then these S cells are kind of recept are uh, prone to noise. All kinds of random ambient noise can cause these things to fire. So what the C cells, I can't see the mouse. The C cells actually connected to collections of S cells, which are all looking at the same region or approximately the same region. And the C cell responded to the largest from a bank of S cells. So for example, if you had, uh, if you had this, this was your image, then your retinal cells might be looking at these three guys. So the retinal cells are going to be capturing this kind of orientation. You would have one S cell over here and somewhere, some similar region, something that's very close here would, would excite another S cell and then another S cell. So you had a bunch of these S cells. And then this one was responding to the largest. If you, this one's response was basically the largest of these three guys. So this was effectively a max. And so the C cells sort of uh, ends up giving you the same orientation as the, uh, as the S cells. But if any of the S cells have some weak responses, it's going to or, mi or miss some signal by looking at the max. It sort of gives you a more robust response. And so uh, the complex C cells, the C cell responses built from similarly oriented simple cells or S cells, which is to say they fine tune the response to the S cells. And now the entire visual system had a complex buildup in their experiments. 
So it wasn't just that you had the simple C cells, you know, one set of uh, C cells and one set of S cells. Uh, you would have the retina. This is your retina. And then you would have S cells and S cells, you have a collection of S cells. Each S cell is going to be looking at a small region of the input. Then you have a C cell where a C cell looks at a collection of collection of uh, S cells to clean up its response. And then you had the next level of S cells. And the next level of S cells were connected to a set of C cells. And they were looking at a region that was composed by these C cells and they were, they would respond here. And oh good God. This is Okay, and so then, sorry. And then these C cells were, this is really problematic. I'm not sure why this is behaving so today. So these C cells would be looking, cleaning up the region of uh, the responses by the S cells in a region. And then the next set of S cells would be looking at, I give up. Regions of, I'm not going to try to draw anything more today. This is not going to work. My one note is just not working. Right. So uh, uh, the C cells, subsequent C cells would actually sort of build more complex patterns. S cells would build more complex patterns from the responses of the C cells. So you get the idea, right? There's this hierarchical structure even within the, I'm going to try one last time, even within the human brain or the animal brain where uh, you have an initial level where you have some neurons which capture some patterns. Then you have this cleanup neurons which sort of clean up their response. And then the next level of neurons, the next level of neurons actually sort of operate on collections of these guys. So as you go up the chain, the patterns that these things respond to become more and more complex. These are maybe looking at lines. These are looking at, you know, uh, patterns formed by lines. And then, 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 and then you have, these are S, so you'd have another C cleaning it up. Then you have an S. These are patterns composed from these patterns and so on. So as you went up the hierarchy, the model got more and more complex. So this was Weibel, Hubel and Wiesel's uh, experiment way back in the 1950s, where they saw how the, uh, the mammalian uh, visual system actually responded. Now, of course, they had to sacrifice a whole lot of cats for this, and then they went on to sacrifice monkeys and ran even more experiments, and uh, the whole thing turned out to be kind of horrible. And uh, this is the punchline that, uh, adding insult to injury, they later con concluded that their model was perhaps not quite right. This model cannot accommodate color, spatial frequency, and many other features to which neurons are tuned. And at that point, they said the exact organization of these cortical columns within V1 remains a hot topic, topic of current research. So anyway, there's a poll, guys. Can we have the poll? Yes, Professor. Yes, here's a poll, everybody. And for those who cannot see it, yeah. slide 14. Can stop this in five. Okay, so anyway, I'm not sure why, how anybody heard C cells find patterns and S cells clean them up. It's exactly the other way around, right? Anyway, this whole thing clearly is, I mean, this is a, this is a, a, a reasonably good representation of what happens in the mammalian brain and 
can potentially be computationalized. And that job, you fast forward from the 1950s all the way to 1980, and you end up with Kunihiko Fukushima, who came up with, who computationalized this model. And in doing so, he actually addressed one of the key deficiencies in their model, and that is that of position invariance. Now, how many of you have heard of the Jen Jennifer Aniston neuron? Anyone? Has anybody heard of this term, the Jennifer Aniston neuron? <laughs> Anyone on chat? Yep. <laughs> yeah, okay, at least one person. Do you remember what that is? Uh, yeah, it's like a neuron that only responds to pictures of uh, Jennifer An Aniston. I think there's also like a Halle Berry neuron. Yeah, exactly, right. So uh, it turns out, you know, epilepsy, people, people who suffer from epilepsy, ep epilepsy have sometimes undergo brain surgery to treat the lesions in their brain. And so they end up in the hospital for several days with their skulls taken off and their brains exposed. And... Uh, Along come these researchers who found find this is an excellent opportunity to run some human subject experiments. I'm not sure who actually gives them permission to do so, but then they come and place a mesh of electrodes sensors on the brain, and they give these patients various stimuli and measure the responses on this mesh of sensors. And this is like one entire field of research. While running one of these experiments in the early 2000s, they found that one of their patients had a neuron that only fired when he was specifically shown pictures of Jennifer Aniston. So there was this paper about the Jennifer Aniston neuron that appeared in Nature. Now, uh, it turns out it's not just Jennifer Aniston. The actual person is not the key point here. The key point here is that we have neurons that fire only when we see a very specific person. For example, almost all of us have a grandmother cell that only fires when we see grandma. It doesn't, now here's the key piece. It doesn't matter where grandma is, whether she's off to the right or whether she's off to the left or dead center. If grandma's in the picture, that neuron's gonna fire. And this is not explained by Hubel and Wiesel's model. So Fukushima sort of incorporated this kind of position invariance into his model, which gave this model the capacity to fire regardless of where grandma was. And this model was the neocognitron. So uh, obviously the fact that he's calling this the neocognitron cues you into something, which is that he must have had a previous model called the cognitron, and then he updated it and he called this the neocognitron. Now in his model, the visual system consists of a hierarchy of modules. Each module has, a, has two layers, a layer of S cells followed by, so this, these dotted lines show the individual modules. And each module has two sets of neurons, a layer of S cells followed by a layer of C cells. So the S cells correspond to Hubel and Wiesel's simple cells. The C cells correspond to their complex cells. So uh, the input comes in from the neuron. This is, the, this is his model. The input comes in from the retina, and that is the image itself. This input is processed by the first block. It's actually processed by the S layer in the first block. The C layer operates on the S layer. Then the S layer of the second block operates on the output of the C layer in the first block, and then that has its own C layer, which operates on the S layer's output. The output of the second C layer, second block C layers, then operated on by the S layer of the third block and so on. The specific architecture over here is that only these S cells are plastic. What we mean by plastic is that they are the only cells that can learn. These C cells, they are not plastic. The C cells are kind of fixed in their response. They, they are not learned. So this is the uh, key aspect of his model. And specifically, here's what the S cell actually looked on. Within each S block, this S block, they were actually, uh, the S cells are organized in several rectangular groups called S planes, as shown in this figure. Within each S plane, all the cells have identical responses but then each cell is looking at a slightly different region of the 
input. So uh, if you had a uh, if you had a collection of S cells of this kind within each within each S plane, you have several cells, and all of these cells have identical response. They are looking at the input. The only difference is that each of these guys is looking at a different region of the input. So uh, the uh, now the C cells are also organized into rectangular planes and they're called C planes. So there's one C plane per S plane. All the C cells also have identical fixed response. And adjacent C cells look at somewhat non-overlapping regions. So the C planes are smaller than the corresponding X planes. And in Fukushima's original model, the uh, C cells and the S cells each looked at elliptical regions. So if you had an if you had an S plane, this guy might look at this elliptical region out here. Then this guy might look at, say, this elliptical region out here, and so on. And then you had the uh, C plane. And the C plane over here, this guy might look at this elliptical region out here. And this guy might look at this elliptical region out here and so on. And that's how they computed their responses. Now, so here is the a full depiction of the model. This was, uh, uh, at each, at the input, U0. By the way, so does this figure remind you of something? This business of this collection of C cells, each looking at a different position of the input. What does that remind you of? Scanning MLP. It is, it's exactly like a scanning, a scanning neuron. It's not, not an MLP, right? It's a single yes, neuron. Yes. It's a single scanning neuron. So you can begin to see the genesis of where CN convolutional neural networks came from. So here is a full depiction of the model. This guy, the U at Z, at the input, you have U0, this is the red. Now, following that, you have several blocks. Now, in the first block, you have a collection of S planes. Each cell on in, in each of the S planes in the first layer looks at an elliptical region of the input to compute its response. And all the cells within any given S plane have identical response. Each cell of the first C plane computes its response from an elliptical region of the corresponding S plane. Now in subsequent layers, each S plane looks at, uh, each uh, cell in the S plane looks at elliptical regions of the previous three C plane, and then the corresponding C plane looks at, C plane cells look at ellipt elliptical regions of the uh, S plane within the same block. And so you have this entire sequence of operations. Now, again, the key point here is that all of the cells in this plane have identical responses. And the other key point over here is that these cells responses can be learned these guys have fixed behavior. And of course, the C planes, because they have non-overlapping responses. So actually this kind of, this figure that I drew over here is kind of wrong. Uh, in Fukushima's original model, uh, if this S cell, if say, if I had an S cell looking over here, then the next S cell would not look at the same region. It would actually look out here, which is why the uh, C planes were smaller than the S planes. Now, and so as a result, as you go through this point, this, this uh, model, the, the uh, planes get smaller and smaller and shrink. Now the neocognitron model has formulae for the activations of the S and C planes. Obviously, if the S cell is looking at an elliptical region of the previous uh, C plane, it's computing some response from those numbers and they had this really hideous looking formula. I'm not really sure where he got it from for the response of the S plane. And so also the C cells had this formula that they used to compute the responses from the, from the S planes. And again, this is an equally uh, uh, complicated looking formula. And the nice thing is while they look complex, 
if you just analyze them carefully, this first thing simply looks like a ReLU and this thing looks like a max. So what the S-plane is effectively doing is computing some weighted sum of the inputs or of the elliptical region from the previous plane and then applying a ReLU activation to it. And what the C-plane is doing is looking at an elliptical region in the S-plane response and picking the largest value effectively. And so as we go through the network, uh, through the net, the uh, C planes keep getting in smaller and smaller with the layers, which means that the receptive field of any particular cell in the C plane keeps getting larger and larger because this guy looks at an elliptical region out here, which looks at an elliptic and each point of which looks at an elliptical region out here, each point of which looks at an elliptical region out here, each point of which looks at an elliptical region out here. So when you if you track the total input that this guy responds to all the way to the input, it's going to be a fairly large region. This means that these C cells actually end up responding to large scale patterns. And so as you go through the network, the size of the pattern and the complexity of the pattern that each cell responds to becomes greater and greater and greater. Now, questions, anyone? Anything here? Okay. Now, in Fukushima's model, the model used unsupervised learning. So you'd provide the network with some, with some input, and then there is no target output. You just provide inputs. There's no label. And the network just uh, uses an update rule to update its parameters. So uh, the S cell parameters for each plane are random, only the S cell learns, the C cells don't learn. So the S cell parameters for each plane are randomly initialized and they'll learn through Hebbian learning. You'll remember, anybody remember the Hebbian rule? What was the Hebbian learning rule? What was the Hebbian learning rule, guys? Anyone? The networks that uh, are wired together, wired together, something like that? Yep, so mathematically, what did it mean? Uh, the weights would keep increasing. When? Um, so when the neuron fires a neighboring cell or a neighboring neuron, the weight, the connect, uh, the weight that connects these two gets larger and larger. And so mathematically, it means that if both of them are one at the same time, that's when the weight increases, right? Okay, so they basically use this simple Hebbian learning rule. The weight of any connection is updated by the product of the input and the output. But here there's a twist, right? And the twist is this. The twist is uh, I, have, I have an S plane. This is my S plane. And all of these neurons are supposed to have exactly the same response. So can I simply update this one guy and forget about it? Based on say that one guy is looking at this region of the input, right? Would it be okay for me to just update this one cell and forget about it? Anyone? What would the problem be? Guys, I'm waiting for a response. It would be looking for a different pattern than the others. So what would happen if I just updated this one guy? Then it would not be identical to the others. It would not be identical to the others. So how do you fix that? You have to update all of them. You have to update all of them. You fix one, you fix them all, right? And so, so here's what uh, uh, we do. At each position, we do one thing. Uh, I can, uh, these are all the S planes in one layer. And at each position, I'm going to go through all of the S planes and every S plane is going to have responded to some elliptical region of the input out here, right? I pick the S plane for which the response was largest. 
and then correspondingly only for that explanation because I want each of the explains to end, end up learning something different. I don't want them to all to learn the same thing. So you pick the largest explain, explain where the response was largest and then use the Hebbian update rule to update the parameters of that of the neuron for that S plane. But then once you update it, you copy that update to all of the neurons in the S plane. Now, sometimes what will happen is that you have two planes which both have high response for that input, then you randomly choose one or the other. So this, uh, this kind of, the details are not too relevant because we won't, because uh, we don't actually revisit this particular learning rule later. But then this learning rule sort of ensures that different planes learn different features of the input because you're always picking the largest response. And these features get more complex as we go through the layers. So for example, if you're again given many examples of the character A, then the early layers may end up learning patterns like these bars, the neurons in the early layers. And then a few layers later, you may end up seeing patterns like this. And then you might find that the final layer ends up capturing, responding when it sees the complete pattern A. Also, because you have this uh, uh, winner take all strategy, it makes it robust to distortion and noise. And it turns out that it effectively performs unsupervised clustering. So what they found, for example, is, uh, is that, uh, uh, if you gave this model lots of images of digits, eventually when you looked at the final layer neurons, the, uh, the final uh, C plane, you'd find that one C plane would respond perhaps only to, uh, to uh, instances of zero. The second one would respond only to instances of one. The third one would respond only to two. And this response was robust, regardless of whether you, whether you had minor distortions to these inputs or whether you sprinkled noise on it or not. So the neocognitron, this was Fukushima's model, was automatically able to sort of segregate visual concepts without supervision. Now, which leads us to the next question. So there's a second poll, guys. You pull up the poll. These are the two questions for the second poll. Okay, let's stop here. No. No. So clearly, this is just a CNN. And clearly all of you agree that you can add a, add supervision. So rolling this back to you, how would you add supervision to this model? Anyone? How would you add supervision to this model? Backprop. But there is this model itself doesn't have any uh, any um, output. Output, right? So how would you add supervision to it? Isn't it kind of like a threshold where it fires when it sees the pattern. It doesn't fire when it does. So you're first going to need a decision layer, right? Yeah. This, this has no. This this makes no takes no decisions. So, uh, the pro. But the way you would do it is, if I were to give you this job, if I were to give you this model, and if I were to ask you what would you do next to add supervision, how would you go about it? Create a decision layer. You'd add. You'd pass all of these outputs into a decision layer. And now the decision layer has an output. Now you can provide labels. You can do training, right? 
And it's almost kind of obvious that this is what you would do because uh, clearly that's the only thing missing. And so something that's so obvious to us when we look at the model just once wasn't so obvious to people for almost nine years. And eventually people figured you can actually add external supervision. So you had various papers for this. Uh, if you were looking at time series models, you had Homa and Atlas, you had Marx. Uh, uh, they came up with temporal correlation over in CMU. Uh, uh, Kevin Lang uh, had this really nice work on time delay neural networks that was invented here at CMU. And Jan LeCun did this for three-dimensional inputs, convolutional neural networks. All of them did, did this at more or less the same time. So all you do is to add an extra decision layer after the final C layer. This produces a class label output. Now you have a fully feed forward MLP with shared parameters. All the S planes within an S, all the S cells within the S within an S plane have the same weights by this model. And so again, you are not going to update the C planes. You're only going to learn the S planes. So, but besides that, you can just use backprop and train the entire network. Now, again, remember that the original neocognitron actually has many S planes and many C planes with many identical copies, physically identical copies of each neuron, of, of a neuron in each uh, uh, S and C plane. Now, in Lekun's model, he made a few changes. First, these elliptical things are really hard to deal with. So he converted, converted them to square receptor fields. So the S-plane neurons now have some K, K cross K receptor field within the input. So this S-plane neuron would have some square K cross K receptor field. The C-plane units would have some L cross L receptor field within the uh, within the uh, S plane and the size of the receptive field could change from layer to layer to layer. So here is the entire operation of the S neurons. Uh, each S plane neuron over here uh, computes a weighted sum of the outputs of the previous layer C plane. So this, this summation, you'll see it's a double summation. It's because it's, because it's going over a square region of the input. And so this means that it has a square pattern of weights. It imposes the square pattern of weights on the corresponding square region of the input and computes a weighted sum. And then it computes. So here is the key piece. And this was also true in Fukushima's model, I, I failed to mention. So in Fukushima's model, if you had an S this way, if this was a C plane, and then if you had the next S plane, this guy wasn't just looking at an elliptical region here, it was simultaneously looking at elliptical regions in all of these guys. So this one would respond to the total stimulus from this, from the, from across all the C planes in the previous layer. So Lekun's model does the same thing. This is, if you have the S plane, you have the, corresponding C planes, you sort of have a pattern of weights and you would look at simultaneously at all of the previous layer C planes. And if the combined, and you look at the combined weighted sum of all of these guys and apply an activate. So this is the summation over all of the planes and then you'd apply an activation function to that weighted sum. And then the C planes, the difference between the S planes and the C planes was this, that while the S plane looked at all of the C planes simultaneously, a C plane only looked at the corresponding S plane. It did not look at the other S planes. So these connections were not, were not uh, did not exist. The C plane only looks at the, at the S plane, but an S plane, which is actually learns to detect patterns, the C plane's job is to clean up patterns, right? The S plane looks at all of the C planes in the previous layer simultaneously. This was again 
Fukushima's model, which models Hubel and Wiesel's biological model. And so what Lacoon here has here has nothing really novel. It's just uh, uh, an, uh, a simple modification or a simple extension of Fukushima's model. So, wait, where am I? So this guy. So each neuron over here looks at a collection of rectangular regions here. It computes a weighted sum over all of, of all of those guys and sums over all of the uh, sums over all of the planes, and then finally applies an activation, and then so you get the S plane responses. And the C plane looks at a small rectangular region at the output of the S plane and simply picks the largest guy, largest response. So uh, here, this was what we call the, uh, here was a uh, video of Lecun's demo for LANET, used to recognize handwritten digits. This is now called the MS corpus. But back in the 80s and the, I mean, this is the trivialist problem you will work on. But back in the 80s and 90s, recognizing handwritten digits was like a real problem for the US Postal Service. And so Lecun's model was designed to address their problem. And I think they actually ended up using LANET to recognize handwritten digits. So you can see the video that he still has on his website here. As the digits come by, uh, the network does a really good job of recognizing the digits. This was back in the early 90s, 30 years ago. And so here's the story so far. The mammalian visual cortex consists of S cells, which capture oriented visual patterns and C cells, which perform a majority vote over groups of S cells. The neocognitron emulates this behavior with planar bank of banks of S and C cells with identical response to enable shift invariance. And Lecun's LANET added, uh, added external supervision to the neocognitron, where now with one difference, that instead of actually, one more difference, that instead of actually creating a bank of neurons, he now replaced this computation with, a, with an actual physical scan of the input. But we know that the two are computationally equivalent. So this gives us the convolutional neural network. Questions? Questions, anybody? Any question? Okay. Anything on chat? Yes. No. Okay. All right. So, do you get a historical perspective of where the model came from? It didn't come from the perspective of scanning for an input using an MLP as we saw it and reorganizing the manner in which we perform the computation. That seems intuitive. But the original genesis is from biology, from Fubel and Wiesel's model. Now, once we sort of laid the framework out, we can actually go into the design of the entire structure. So uh, I am sort of out of time now. It's 9.20. I'll pick up from here in the next class. And I'm, again, I'm apologizing in advance for being too slow. This series of CNN lectures is probably going to extend by another lecture. And you'll have to bear with me. Questions? Questions, anyone? Yeah, Professor, I, I have a question. Yeah. Uh, so, so the main point of, uh, you know, the main crux of the problem of learning a general outline of, of input lies when, when you showed a slide where there was the letter A and the first layer only learned just one lines. Yeah. Uh, how so what how and 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 the reason is, what what is the reason is is it that most of the most of the weight in the weight space it's an inhibitory re region and 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 it, they only fire in a certain way so again how do you force them so how do you, you force them yeah so so this is a, this is an unsupervised learning algorithm there's real yeah. so, and you know the it even because it's un, it's unsupervised even the weights if you have negative weights they are inhibitory if you have positive weights they are excitatory so even the pattern of weights is fully learned right uh, we don't force it yeah all that all that happened over here is that you had this hierarchy of layers 
and you just let unsupervised uh, learning do its magic with the specific set of rules that we just mentioned. And the specific set of rules is based on biology. We have reason to believe that the human brain works somewhat on heavy and learning. And so all Fukushima did was to create the structure which was modeled on biology, but added this notion of position invariance, the grandmother cell, and then just ran on supervised learning using learning rules, which kind of emulated what the human brain does. And the fact that it learns these patterns is pretty magical. It seems to indicate that that's basically what's happening even in your head, at least gives you reason to believe that, that you sort of learn to compose structures hierarchically. And the interesting thing is you actually end up reusing structures. So while the final layer neurons end up capturing digits of this kind, completely unsupervised, they are going to be reusing some of the patterns or many of the patterns learned by the lower layer neurons. So for example, you might have a lower layer neuron learning a vertical horizontal stroke that ends up being used for both the digits two and four. So it's yeah. there are no rules, it just learns it. All we did when we did the CNN was to impose some external supervision in a very obvious manner. Could, could the, this is just still that single section of the brain where you're finding out what, what mammals are seeing, right? So but, no, so, so this is the V1 cortex, but now we're actually looking at the entire layer of analyses, right? So it's still within, it's, it's, it goes through several layers of the cortex, but at this point, we are no longer actually looking at the brain anymore, right? This is just the, if you go back to the original biological study, they found that they had these layers of cells. Mm -hmm. where each layer was looking at the previous layer of cells. And within each layer, you had two, two sub layers, one which detected patterns and one which cleaned them up. My, right. my, my immediate response to that was then, is there a decision layer there? And so I was thinking maybe the outputs would then be going to another section of the brain that could be a decision layer that could be providing feedback. But I guess that's what you're saying is that's not happening. We don't know that it's happening, whether it's happening or not. The brain is immensely complex. Remember, we don't really have your entire life is one giant, you know, mostly uh, experience of mostly unsupervised learning, right? Mm -hmm. You've learned, I mean, people have been studying this stuff for decades and I don't believe we have any real solid understanding of how supervision happens inside the brain yet. Okay, thank you. Any other questions, guys? All right, thank you. So stop the recording. We'll pick up right here for the next class.